Okay, I had an opportunity to speak. This is other church that I go to. So, de depending on who's there, my, my pastor had a concussion. The Lord spoke to me, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, why don't you teach on what Paul wrote to Timothy? Maybe that would encourage somebody. But that's not what I'm speaking on tonight. So, uh, Steve asked me if I would be interested, and I said yes, sure. So, I went through the first two books, the first two letters, and I, I came up with certain things that I thought maybe would encourage somebody. One, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is, is, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand what they are saying or matters about which they make confident assertions. Two, this command I turn trust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Three, first of all then, I urge that all entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that they may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Now this four, it's about being an overseer. An overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectful, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into a condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach in the stare of the devil. Five, but the, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience with a, as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared in, in by those who believe and know the truth. Six, be const, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. Seven, prescribe and teach these things. And that no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Do not neglect the spiritual glyph within you, which has, was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying out of hands by Presbytery. Take pa pains with all these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in all these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation for both yourself and for those who hear you. Keep yourself free from sin. Number eight, I remind you, to kindle a blaze afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but the power of love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. To kindle to a blaze, to kindle up in flames when mind strength and zeal. Nine, guard the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. The treasure which has been entrusted to you. Be, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, but to avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their tasks are spread like angry. And 10, now you followed my teachings, con conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, sufferings, that, that, that. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in these things you have learned and become convinced of, of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So those are the 10 things I came up with. And now I'm sweating because of the camera, but he can edit that out. So I began to, I began to, to, to think about that, and, and, and I spoke on those things, and I, and I kind of broke them down into like one word. Remember the gift of God that's in you. Or, you know, guard the Holy Spirit. You know, so I, I came up with buzzwords that maybe that, that they could walk away with. Mm -hmm. so, so as Steve was talking at dinner, 
about how that gentleman has to lay hands on him for the Holy Spirit to come in. Well, maybe people in the church never heard that. Mm -hmm. So they might go to the pastor and, and ask for a baptism in the Holy Spirit to set him on fire. So I began to, you know, you know Steve talks oftentimes how uh, the Spirit of the Lord talks to him about different things. You know, you're going through, you, you're in your time of prayer and he talks to you and then you hear it somewhere else and it kind of it flows. So, you know, I, I, would, I would began to think, you know, about the things that we've learned here, you know, about that, the one thing. The one thing, the, the integration of our soul and spirit. I went to a prayer room and no one interacted with each other. And comparing it here to the well, I was like, you know, no one, no one really interacted with each other. You know, they're all off doing their own thing. And I think the spirit works through that too. But I think there's some, some type of thing going on here mm -hmm. where the power of God really moves through people coming in, in, into harmony. So I began to... Think about uh, that thought when I heard a, a St. Irenaeus quote of, the glory of God is man fully alive. So I, I spoke to Steve about it, and he said it's, it's all based on how you unpack it. I began to think about that, you know, so I, I kind of spoke on that subsequently after that 10-point thing I came up with. So I just figured I just would read that out just to give some type of frame of reference of what my thoughts were all about. So the, the initial thought was, how can we establish a personal revival in our life from Paul's writings to his spiritual son and young man Timothy? So that, those are the total things I came up with, just to take, make it real easy. So how can we establish a personal revival in our own life from Paul's writings to letters to Timothy, his spiritual son? So then I started hearing about the glory of God as man fully alive. Is that a question? No, that's a, that's a statement. A statement. So then I began to think about that. As Steve recommended, I, need, I needed to think of how do I unpack that statement, the glory of God is man fully alive. Based on that prayer meeting and the well and interactions that I have with my friends and family, I want to personally have God move me into deeper areas of my own humanity. If that makes any sense. So then I began to think about it. Mark 16, 24. 6, 24? Oh, maybe 6, 20. 6, 24. Okay. <laughs> and I'm thinking Mark okay. 16. It doesn't have a 24th verse. I call that the Kuzak anointing when I write things down around. She <laughs> asked her mother for the head of John the Baptist. <laughs> That's this camera thing. Hold <laughs> on. Matthew 16, 24. Uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> come on. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Is that what you wanted? That's right. Okay, so so Philippians 2, 7. I got this one right. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ no. Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with yeah, God, right. but emptied himself. That's right. Yeah. So so can can we learn, Can we? Uh, the thought was, can we learn anything about denying ourselves and then Jesus stepping out of, him, out of the out of heavens, right, to become a man where he emptied himself of all divine privileges and, and he walked fully in humanity. He became fully human. So if we emptied themselves of ourselves, right, to affirm that one has not an, an acquaintance or connection with someone. So I'm emptying myself, that, that word deny, to affirm that one has not acquaintance or, or connection with someone. To forget oneself, lose sight of oneself, and of one's own interest. So that's kind of deep, right? I mean, the word, that word deny. So, that, so that's the thought. So Jesus, to, to empty, to lay aside equality with the form of God, to deprive himself of some force, to, to, to and it, there's some uh, realm of identity there. So us, us, we have, you know, as you said, that a lot of this stuff doesn't really work if, we're, if we don't have the, the, the understanding that we're his son, the identity of, of his son. I've been, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about the spare. You know, in that Psalm 24, it also talks about some other stuff. I would despair if I didn't believe. If I deny myself, and I've emptied myself of all that other stuff, something has to f fill it. Something else has to come in and fill it. That's where a friend of mine says you have to choose the fruit. And if you choose the fruit, don't then we start walking in the fullness of our humanity? Because we've emptied himself of us, self of all that other stuff. So by that quote of being the glory of God, even though there's the glory of God is so much more than that, but a component of the glory of God is man fully alive when you choose the fruit. You've chosen the fruit and you're, and you're walking in the fullness of our humanity. Because as Steve said in Genesis 2, what he made was very good. So we were very good. So but by denying ourselves and filling ourselves with the divinity, that, that provides us to walk in being alive in his glory. Because if I, if I looked at, you know that First Peter 5.10, you want to read that? But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, 
after you have suffered a while. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So you know that word, the word perfect, mm -hmm. make one what he ought to be. That, that, so that seems to me that the glory of God is man fully alive. That's, that's glorious in our life. You know, in Psalm 51 where he talks about the crushing. For you delight not in sacrifice or else I would give it. You find no pleasure in burnt offering. My sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Such, O oh God, you will not despise. And that bro the word broken and contrite mean basically the same thing, the one that is crushed. This is uh, John, the first chapter. I don't know if it's in your notes there. No. I think this is part of what you're saying. Okay. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what you're saying. Yeah, we model that. Now, we could. We choose to. The we, Word made flesh, yeah. fully human, and we beheld His glory. Right. Because the glory of God is man, fully alive. What he read from Philippians, how Jesus emptied himself and took on the form of man. He's quoting Irenaeus as the one who said, the glory of God is man, fully alive. So in John, the first chapter, he says, the word was made flesh. The word, Jesus, was made flesh, took on the form of a servant. And John says, we beheld his glory, the glory of God, as the only begotten son of God at that moment, in terms of, he was, the, he was the first one, the model for us, of one that was fully alive. So John is saying we beheld his glory. We could see the glory of God in a man who was fully alive. I think that's what Irenaeus yes. is, is saying. He's pulling that all together. So in all of us, as Mark has been saying, as we're emptying ourselves of ourselves and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which is what you're doing, you're becoming you're not becoming fully divine, you're becoming fully human. Yes. Filling yourself with divinity, you're becoming fully human. That's not the incarnation, I'm not sure what it is. Well, there you go. <laughs> and there's That's ton, yeah, and there's a ton there's a ton of stuff that actually kind of supports that. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in for, for the first Corinthians chapter fifteen, the mm -hmm. first Adam, the second Adam, mm -hmm. you know, and all that type of stuff. Uh, first and that is with Philippians two, by the way, that's what Paul's on about when he says let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who didn't try to take something from God. He's referring to Adam without saying Adam. Adam was trying to take something from God. Jesus wasn't like that. He didn't think it was robbery. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going yeah. to take something from God mm -hmm. like the first Adam. He was going to totally empty himself before God and take on what? The form of a human that Adam was trying to go the other way. He was trying to take the divinity. He's completely reversed it. Paul's completely reversed and said, I got it. Now I see what this is about. And it's an interesting pattern. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a different pattern. It's an opposite pattern, but it's a, good, it's a pattern just the same for us because mm -hmm. the, the Bible is a book of pattern. I mean, so I, I, think, this, I think there's a ton of, ton of supporting. It's just all, it's all, just all laid out in that way. Mm -hmm. So as I, as I begin to think about it, man fully alive. You know, and it, re and it really uh, hit home recently when an acquaintance of mine committed suicide recently. He was total in despair, and he wasn't fully alive. And in fact, he had to take his own life to do something that was just tragic, right? I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it was, so it really kind of, it really bothered me, and it still bothers me, and it will bother me for a long time. But being fully alive means that we're walking in the fullness of our humanity that he originally created us for in the first place. Mm -hmm. Even though there might be some divine, cool divine things that everybody's searching out in this day and age. But I think I'd rather be walking in the fullness of my humanity that's been provided back to me by carrying around his presence. Did that make any sense? Yeah. No. And out of that is going to come the divine just by his nature. Being in us. Yes. Healing or, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. uh, you know, some kind of divine manifestation because of that fullness of humanity. Because even, even if you're, these, shine, these signs shall accompany those who believe. It's not like they're not out in front of me. They're alongside with me. Right? So it's, it's nothing that I'm going to do because we, we carry his presence. First John four seventeen. In this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, which with assurance and boldness to, to face him, because as he is, so are we in this world. So it led to that whole thing with, with Paul at the end of his life. I kept on hearing about this drink offering being poured out. 
You know, and that's supposed to offer Timothy some encouragement, I think, in some way. But he's basically telling him, you know, I'm, I'm, my life is coming to an end here. You know, so some people wouldn't be encouraged about that. But he says, you know, fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. And in many ways, that's what we're called to do. And how do we do that? By being fully alive. The glory of God is man fully alive. And that's the only way we, we possibly can walk those, finish those three things. Fight the good fight. It's a good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. As he's, as he's being ready to be poured out as a drink offering, you know, pouring himself out. Well, he already has poured himself out. You know, his, his life is just ending as well, but he's truly poured himself. Paul already poured himself out. And it, it is a, and as Steve and I talk, it's a matter of the will. And, and, I, and I came across this, I am re, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Are you ready to be poured out as an offering? It's an act of your will, not your emotions. Tell God you're ready to be offered as a sacrifice for him. Then accept the consequences as they come without any complaints in spite of what God may send your way. God sends you through a crisis in private where no other person can help you. From the outside, your life may appear to be the same, but the difference is taking place in your will. Once you have experienced a crisis in your will, you will have no thought of the cost when it begins to affect you externally. If you don't will, deal with God at the level of your will first. The result will only be to arouse sympathy for yourself. So it's more like if you don't want, if you don't if you don't want change, don't seek God. Did you write that or did you quote that from? Somebody? That was a quote from uh, the Oswald Chambers, and I just happened to read it at the same time that I was thinking about all this stuff. So I think that's how the Holy Spirit works, right? So you know, of course, there's of course there's suffering involved, Val, but you know, God will deal with our suffering. He'll guide us through this process, and through that suffering, I think we really start recognizing our fullness in humanity. Moreover, let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patience and unswerving endurance. And endurance develops maturity of character, and character produces joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us, for God's love has been poured out in our hearts the Holy Spirit who has been given us. We've been emptied and we've been filled by Him. I, I, you know, you know what? I, can I can I share something that's really cool? Sure. I think it's really cool. No, I have that John run one right there, right there. See John one on the correct page. <laughs> okay, ready? And it goes back to Psalm twenty seven. Oh, in Psalm sixteen, their sorrow shall be multiplies who ch who choose another god. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer or to take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen and signed portion of my cup. You hold and maintain my life. Okay, so that, that drink offering of blood in Psalm 16.4, you've heard this before? I've read that Psalm before, yeah. Is an allusion to the heathen practice of mingling the blood of animals with wine or water and pouring out the mixture in worship of the gods. And yet this idea is conveyed that the psalmist would not partake in the, of the abominations of the heathen. Didn't just Jesus fulfill that in 1934? <laughs> but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came and flowed out. Didn't he fulfill that? So, I, you know, I was thinking about all the, the, the foreign gods that they all had back there, and they were, they were pretty much all stemmed from three, right? Um, Ashroth, yeah, Ashdoth. Yeah, there's five yeah. major Babylonian gods, but I mean, it depends on how you count them. The God made himself manifest to all of us. He, he, he became human. And through his humanity, and he's emptying ourselves, provides us a, a, an opportunity to empty ourselves, be filled with him, that makes us fully alive. A couple of scriptures. Okay. Colossians 1.19 For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Hey Russ, why don't you grab Ephesians 3.19 And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's a nice combination here, isn't it? It is. Colossians 1.19 For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And then over in Ephesians 3.19 he says, but this is for you too, that in you all the fullness of God should dwell. The whole point, the fullness of God in humanity, the glory of God, is man fully alive with the fullness of God. That's, it, it almost has a kind of, it's almost like an oxymoron. The mm -hmm. fullness of God and the fullness of man was originally probably tended to be one. Which many would argue, I use that in the right way, that that's what Adam would have experienced mm -hmm. had he not pulled back from God. He was on the road to becoming like Christ was, so to speak, like Jesus was. Which is where Paul gets that Philippians 2. It's actually like a song. is presenting 1 Corinthians 15, the first Adam and the last Adam, the natural tendency to try to take something from God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, you don't have to take anything from him, just ask. That's what sons do. They ask. Do we take? No, you empty. Empty, you make room. 
for the fullness. And then you're full of life. What do you suppose suffering is? To experience a sensation or impression, usually painful, feel passion, suffer, in the most general sense, to be affected by something from without, to be acted upon, to undergo an experience. In the New Testament, use of evil meaning to suffer, be sub subjected to evil. It's just feeling passion or pathos. Mm. Patho, feeling okay. something being affected by something outside of ourselves. In that way. If we're walking in the fullness, will we suffer? Yep. I, I, my first thought was going to things like, oh, you lost your job, or this or that. You know, and all of that would be so superficial if you're walking in the fullness of him, you know he's going to take care of your needs. Mm -hmm. So that would not be a suffering like that. I think the suffering, we still suffer. suffer. It's just how we suffer. You're still, everybody suffers. There's suffering in this world for a number of different reasons. How we actually suffer, how we get through it, how we process it, a variety of different things. But it's still suffering. Christ suffered. You know, I've talked with people over the years. Well, they, he knew this. He knew, yeah, I, I know. He, he knew it all. I get it. Who, for the joy that was set before him, you know, endured the cross. He was suffering. The question you're asking, by the way, is a question that should be asked more often in the church. The church stays totally away from the whole subject. 